until a few years ago, the ancient complex structures believed to mark the pinnacle of early human civilization included the likes of dolmen remnants and the iconic Egyptian pyramids, dating back approximately 5,000 to 7,000 years before the Common Era. However, the archaeological landscape underwent a seismic shift with the groundbreaking discovery of Gobekli Hill in Turkey. This revelation forced a re-evaluation of our understanding, pushing the origins of sophisticated civilizations and advanced construction techniques back to an astonishing 10,000 years before Christ. The assimilation of Gobekli Tepe into mainstream historical narratives took about two decades, highlighting the resistance to challenging established beliefs. Nevertheless, as the dust settled, this archaeological revelation became an accepted part of our ancient history. In the ongoing exploration of humanity's past, a recently unearthed structure in Indonesia, known as the Gunung Padang site, has taken center stage. This site, if recognized, could potentially extend the timeline of civilization by an additional 15,000 years, challenging the boundaries of our historical knowledge. Notably, a group of courageous scientists has championed the cause, presenting Gunung Padang to the world. However, the reception from mainstream history has been met with skepticism, with attempts to downplay its significance already underway. The unfolding discourse surrounding Gunung Padang exemplifies the continual tug of war between groundbreaking discoveries and the established historical narrative. The outcome of this intellectual struggle holds the potential to either illuminate the obscured chapters of human history or consign them to the shadows once again. Welcome to the Spacey Sagas channel. The stories of countless individuals who either fail to comprehend the significance of their discoveries or are suppressed by the influential powers of their time are abundant in history. For instance, Nikola Tesla's groundbreaking work on electricity technologies and Rosalind Franklin, one of the scientists who first discovered the double helix structure of DNA, faced neglect, with Franklin's contributions overlooked merely because she was a woman. While James Watson and Francis Crick received the Nobel Prize for the same discovery, Franklin's name remained unmentioned. Numerous examples of such instances abound, and the world of archaeology is no exception. Gobekli Hill, initially discovered by Istanbul University, provides an illustrative example. However, its importance was downplayed, and research halted. It took 30 years for Klaus Schmid and his team from Heidelberg University to reignite interest and secure Gobekli Hill's place in history. Similarly, a comparable incident occurred in the Dutch East Indies in 1914, during the colonial period in Java. Colonizers, drawn to the region's cleared areas, started to spread and learn about local legends. One of these tales caught the attention of Dutch historian Nicolaas Johannes Krom in 1914. The story spoke of Ki Sandin, a hero or god revered by the locals, credited with building a sacred city on terraces overnight to protect people from imminent evil and disaster. Intrigued by this narrative, Krom explored the region and came across an extraordinary hill swallowed by dense forests. In his book, he described it as four large terraces carved into the top of a mountain, connected by vertical sections of andesite columns resembling a graveyard. Krom submitted a report detailing his findings to the Imperial Antiquities Directorate in 1914, urging the dispatch of a team and resources for further exploration. However, the Dutch Empire, amidst turmoil, never fulfilled this request. After tumultuous years, Indonesia gained independence in 1949, and both the letter and the existence of this city faded from memory. Fate, however, had different plans. Three local youths stumbled upon the colossal stepped hill, guided by hearsay, and promptly reported their discovery to authorities.
The news prompted the Indonesian Archaeological Research Office to swiftly send teams to the site and commence excavations. This rediscovery, driven by the chance findings of these three individuals, has the potential to rewrite human history from scratch. The first noticeable detail is the colossal stone blocks covering the area, ranging from 3 to 5 meters in length and weighing between 250 kilograms to 1 ton. It is a fact that these massive stones were not shaped by humans, as they are naturally occurring volcanic andesite. The iconic shapes are a result of this geological process, a phenomenon observable in other extraordinary rock formations like the Giant's Causeway in Ireland and Devil's Postpile in California. While the stones may be natural, the sheer quantity, approximately 50,000 of them, is anything but natural. The nearest volcanic mountain to the site is Mount Pangrango, located 50 kilometers away. It's crucial to note that these columns are a result of the solidification of volcanic flows. Additionally, the fact that the hill is elevated 90 meters from the ground and the stones are generally cut to specific dimensions indicates that someone transported these stones from the vicinity to construct the top of the structure. The question arises who and why would someone undertake such an endeavor? As research progressed, archaeologists came to understand that the rocks did not naturally form and disperse initially thought. The stones were arranged to create regular shapes and retaining walls, dividing the top of the hill into distinct zones. The individuals who brought these stones had once built a truly massive structure there, consisting of five terraces connected by 370 steps, covering an area of 2,700 square meters. However, a significant mistake was made, much like in research on Gobekli Hill. After conducting studies, archaeologists concluded that the area was a ruin dating back 2,500 to 3,000 years. Strangely, it was deemed unimportant in terms of historical significance for a structure of this age group. It remains unclear when the Indonesian Archaeological Research Office made this discovery, but in 2012, the narrative took a surprising turn. Archaeologists realized that the 2,500-year-old part was only the surface, and when they began to dig deeper, human history started to change. Geologists Danny Hillman and Ali Ekber, two respected and bold scientists in their fields, led the excavation team. Using advanced technological tools, they expanded their research layer by layer, digging deeper into the region. Ali Ekber announced a significant finding when they reached a depth of four meters, revealing a cultural layer under the hill. According to carbon dating, this layer dates back to 5,200 years before Christ. The intrigue deepens as the team employs advanced techniques such as ground-penetrating radar, seismic tomography, and core drilling to analyze the region's three different layers. They discover that each layer contains both human-made artifacts and an astonishing progression back in time. The second layer, situated four meters below the surface, dates back 7,500 to 8,000 years ago. The third layer, at a depth of 15 meters, astonishingly reaches back nearly 28,000 years. How is such a thing possible? Taking the four meter layer as a reference, if we assume the structure is 7,500 years old, it predates the Sumerian civilization by nearly 3,000 years. However, speaking of 28,000 years ago implies a rewriting of human history as we know it, with almost everything we thought we knew missing from the picture. Imagine discussing something that predates even the Ice Age. The team, armed with this extraordinary information, goes above and beyond to better analyze the depths. In doing so, they discover three major structures interconnected within the layers, gradually descending deeper. The complexion of the matter changes, it is no longer just about a hill with a collapsed surface structure. 
What appeared to be a hill is, in fact, a colossal stepped or terraced pyramid covering a vast 15 hectare area, constructed layer upon layer over thousands of years during different periods. As Danny Hillman explains the findings, we are talking about a human-made structure becoming more sophisticated as they delve deeper a structure rivaling the pyramids of Egypt and the colossal megaliths of Europe, built by a lost civilization. The Indonesian government, following this groundbreaking archaeological data, pours funds into researching the region. Even the Indonesian military intervenes to organize and protect the area. The then Prime Minister Susizolo Bambang Yudhoyono declares it an extremely significant discovery for human history. However, for Danny Hillman and Ali Akbar, troubled times are about to begin. Unexpectedly, their reactions are met with opposition, particularly from their own colleagues. After the events unfold, Danny Hillman will express his disbelief, stating, these findings that could change history turned out to be the last thing my colleagues in the archaeological world wanted. The last thing they wanted was for the discovery to become popular, leading to substantial funding and manpower allocated for the Padang research, Budgets are constrained for the Padang excavation. In fact, there are cases where individuals have received funding for years without making any significant progress. There's also the issue of political lobbying, with project opposing archaeologists using their influence to bring all research to a halt. Mainstream academics, who have their own interests and a vested status quo, resist change vigorously. The primary request from these academics is simple to entirely cease research. The reason behind this insistence is the belief that nothing over 5,000 years old could logically exist in the region. According to mainstream historical perspectives, complex structures were only possible with civilizations like the Sumerians. Anything before them having advanced civilizations is deemed illogical. They argue that the researchers are engaging in speculative work, diverting the entire budget towards imaginary projects. Facing this opposition, Danny Hillman reflects in an interview, saying, I was aware that I was throwing myself into hot water with these claims. Even though the findings we put forward are scientifically valid, we were fighting a much bigger battle here. This battle is not just about scientific data, it's about challenging established norms and confronting the resistance of mainstream academia against change. As the region, once covered by dense forests, is cleared, opening up new excavation areas, archaeologists make a remarkable discovery in the second cultural layer at a depth of four meters. They find an artifact resembling a coin dating back to 5,200 years before Christ. Archaeologists continue to debate whether this object is genuinely a coin or perhaps a decorative item. The significance lies in the possibility that if it is indeed a coin from 5,200 years ago, it challenges the commonly held belief that the first coins were minted by the Lydians in the 7th century BC. To confirm this, further excavation and the discovery of similar coins in the layers are required. Another surprising discovery in the same layer is the pyramid-like structure of the terraced walls of the site. Amidst the blocks of the retaining walls, archaeologists find ancient mortar. The composition of the mortar is intriguing 14% clay, 45% silica, and 45% iron. This is intriguing because the Iron Age, as we know it, did not commence until around 1200 BC. Before that, this technology was used in a basic form at sites like Kaman Kailahuyuk around 2000 BC. However, it's essential to consider that the region is filled with volcanic materials, so the presence of iron in the mortar doesn't necessarily confirm human-made origins volcanic remnants could contribute to this composition. Offering another interesting detail about the site, Gunung Padang translates to Enlightenment Hill the name is chosen to signify a spiritual aspect, as legends depict the area as a sacred space for Enlightenment rituals and ceremonies throughout the ages. The origins and continuity of these rituals remain unknown, 
as the modern world became aware of the structure only a century ago. In 1979, the Indonesian government took renewed interest in the area. The rituals could have been practiced by individuals who knew the region but kept it a secret, or they might have been passed down through generations. Contrary to the claim by the Dutch explorer who discovered the site in 1914, stating it was a massive cemetery, no human bones have been found. Instead, the presence of a collapsed structure and the absence of human remains support the notion that the site is more of a temple-like area than a graveyard. Additionally, priests in the region believe that the stones possess special qualities for spiritual enlightenment and meditation. While this may seem speculative, studies have indeed shown that the stones emit a high level of electromagnetic radiation, validating the priests' claims. This is an intriguing discovery, and while it could be natural due to volcanic activity in the region, what's truly fascinating is the interaction with the stones, causing some to produce musical frequencies. Research has indicated that striking certain stones with the four frequencies used in Western music results in unique sounds. Considering the deep connection ancient civilizations had with sound, this information is far from trivial, it's genuinely fascinating. By the way, in most videos on this channel, and in this video as well, I provide the documents, sources and books mentioned in the claims in the description. Those interested should not forget to check that section. During the Indonesian elections, there is a change in government, with Joko Widodo replacing Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono as the president. Mainstream archaeology finally achieves its dream. After Widodo takes office, one of his initial actions is to completely halt the research at Gunung Padang. He is still in office today, and the research at Gunung Padang remains suspended, abandoned to its fate. However, an unforeseen turn of events took place in the region. In the midst of all these unusual discoveries, a significant development occurs. Indonesia undergoes an election, leading to a change in government, and Joko Widodo is replaced by Jokowi. One of his first actions is to completely halt the research at Gunung Padang. As of today, the site remains closed off, left abandoned. So, what happened that suddenly brought the existence of this pyramid back into the spotlight? This is crucial because it reveals how efforts to suppress human history come into play. On November 20th, 2023, Danny Hillman's article containing all the data about Gunung Padang is published in the academic community. The news spreads instantly on social media and scientific websites, reigniting the debate around Gunung Padang. The article summarizes all the technical details I presented earlier, directly prepared by the lead archaeologist of the site. Interestingly, the archaeological community is shocked by the publication of this article in a mainstream academic channel like Nature. In fact, a probe has been initiated against Nature magazine and the individuals responsible for publishing the article due to this unexpected development. Look, when scientists disagree, especially when it doesn't align with their preconceived notions, it's a perfect example of how they attack each other. A live example of this is unfolding right now. Among the critics, we have archaeologist Fintan O'Weil from Cardiff University. In response to the notion presented in the article that the stones were used to construct an orderly retaining wall, he has provided a counter-argument that, word for word, claims the rolling rocks could have naturally formed this shape. Now let me show you what he means by naturally formed rolling stones with another example. Another archaeologist, Bill Ferrell, from the University of New Haven, has also presented an antithesis against the article. He argues that since no human bones or coal residues, which would be indicative of heating sources for hunter-gatherers, have been found in the area, it cannot be attributed to human construction. 
according to him societies during that time were, at most, hunter-gatherers, and even they would inevitably use such places as burial sites and for making fires. Now it's infuriating, but when I rebel, it gets meaty. Seriously though, science has somehow become so rigid in its frameworks. The guy who wrote the article is not just any random person, he's a highly respected individual who has dedicated decades to the field of archaeology. He published his article properly and suggested, let's resume the halted work and re-evaluate together, but no, now there's an investigation against the institutions that shared and published the article. I mean, really? When did science get so stuck in its own moulds? The person made valid points. Instead of saying, let's examine his claims using our own methods, go there, do our job and collaborate on the excavations with collective knowledge, maybe we'll discover some new insights into human history. They open investigations against the institutions that shared and published the article. It's reached a point where a person argues against the article by claiming stones rolled naturally and formed a retaining wall. Is this the level we've sunk to? Where's the scientific curiosity? Where's the passion for exploring new horizons? We're not debating whether the event is true or false, perhaps it's just a 3,000-year-old relic. However, even that is worth investigating. So why do people who are supposedly curious colleagues attack each other so vehemently? I suggest you ponder this thoroughly. Consider why there's such a strong effort to uphold the false history imposed on us by the West. Try to understand it for yourself, opening the map and starting from the Gulf of Thailand to Indonesia and then to Papua New Guinea, you'll notice that the region looks like shattered remnants scattered around. Indeed, you're looking at a continent that broke apart and submerged thousands of years ago. Around 20,000 years ago, during the last ice age, global sea levels were about 150 to 200 meters lower than today. And in this region, you see the remnants of a landmass the size around 2 million square kilometers. At that time, Java Island, including Gunung Padang, was not an island, it was located at the southern tip of this continent. While the world's poles were covered in ice, this equatorial region hosted diverse life. According to the narrative, a deity, troubled by the world's corruption, decided to send a great flood to cleanse the planet. As the great deluge swallowed continents, the last two survivors sought refuge on the highest mountain. The devastation was so severe that even the mountain was about to be engulfed. In remorse, the deity stopped the flood just before the last two humans died. During this intervention, the remaining land masses that sheltered other surviving life emerged, forming the islands of Indonesia. The last two survivors died, and humanity began to proliferate again. It's the same story everywhere you go, isn't it? Without exception, this narrative continues to appear no matter where you are in the world. Because this is not a myth, it's a memory, and a traumatic one at that. It's an unforgettable memory. That's why, regardless of cultural beliefs, it continues to be passed down from generation to generation by all of humanity. Even today, you can understand this destruction simply by looking at the map. Between 12,000 to 133,000 years ago, during the early Younger Dryas, known as the Deluge, this massive landmass left only what lies submerged in the sea, waiting to be discovered. The reality of this devastation makes you think. If many of the stories we label as myths were true and nothing more than shadows of a forgotten civilization, who knows? Maybe there's some truth in the legends told by the Javanese people about Gunung Padang. Remember, they spoke of how Gunung Padang was transformed into a terraced pyramid with underground chambers to protect the people from an impending evil, according to the legend of the hero god Sang Hyang Manik Maya. Perhaps the construction of this pyramid served as a refuge to shield people from an approaching disaster. It seems like a more logical approach. Only time will reveal what the truth is and what it isn't. 
In the past, the deluge was considered a fabricated belief by religious traditions. Today we find evidence of it all around the world. What were once stories told to children about lost continents are turning out to be real discoveries. While we're forced to learn history in the way Western civilizations, holding mainstream power, dictate, we're now discovering that humanity's civilization history dates much further back than we thought. We owe this realization to historians who are not afraid to talk about what they find. I truly believe that as long as brave individuals, driven by the infinite curiosity inherent in science, continue to carry the torch of truth, facts will eventually come to light. We're learning that the civilization history of humanity goes much further back than the narrative forced upon us by Western civilizations. It's essential for ordinary citizens like us to support these researchers who are unafraid to continue their courageous investigations. Only then can humanity find the truth as millennia-old imposed narratives crumble and the reality of our history emerges from beneath the waters and earth. Thank you all for watching. I hope it has been informative. Please share your thoughts in the comments section. The channel is growing and the comments can now serve as a forum where diverse opinions can be gathered. Until next video, take care of yourselves.